Welcome back to another episode of Let's Face the Facts. I'm your host, my name is David Almeida, and I love talking with people and hearing what they have to say in those rare moments when I can hear them over the sound of my own voice. That's a Paula Poundstone joke, and sadly, it resonates. Anyway, I'm an actor, and I work out of Orlando, Florida, and every week I sit down with an actor or artist friend, we watch an episode of the classic sitcom The Facts of Life, then we hit record, we get to talking, we talk about the show, and anything else it leads us to talk about. Hopefully it's fun, hopefully you enjoy listening, and hopefully you enjoy meeting the the wacky folks here in the diverse and thriving Central Florida arts community. This week, my guest is Logan Donahue. Logan is a local theater guy. He's a performer, a writer. You could call him a, a monologist, or, or you could call him a monologist, if you, you knew how to properly pronounce that word, because I don't. And I checked on the internet, and it wasn't really very helpful. But anyway, he does monologues as in one-man shows. In fact, he recently just did one at the um, Orlando Fringe Festival, which just ended last month, and his show had a program with a short bio. So I'm like, oh, great. I don't need to worry about introducing him. I'm going to introduce you with his own words. Logan Donahue is an award-winning writer and performer, creating independent theater for more than half his life. He's been an on-air DJ and host for college radio station WPRK 91.5 FM, a graduate of the improvisational theater group SAC Comedy Lab, an outspoken queer activist, and a host of various cult movie screenings for over a decade. Logan has been involved in more than 10 different award-winning productions at the Orlando International Fringe Theater Festival, which he has begun to take on tour to other festivals. Some favorites include Creating and Performing, Field Guide to the Gays, Slot Like Me, and Trash Cinema 101, and directing Trey Parker's Cannibal the Musical and Christopher Durang's Sister Mary Ignatius Explains It All for You. Most recently, Logan wrote Truly Divine, a one-woman show for Ginger Minge from Season 7 of RuPaul's Drag Race, which premiered at the 2018 Rochester Fringe Festival. Pretty cool, huh? I need to say no more about Logan, huh? Uh, one quick point I wanted to make before we got going. Remember my rant the other week about the overuse of the last name Parker on the show? I cited three different times they used the last name Parker. I missed one. There were four. Bink Parker. He is such a weenie. The guy who Blair was hoping would talk Joe and Eddie out of getting married in Teenage Marriage Part 1. His name is Parker, too. That's four. Four different unrelated people in the Facts of Life Cinematic Universe, or F-O-L-C-U as I like to call it, with the last name Parker. <sighs> Writers, I am unimpressed. Just want you to think about that. You, you go to your room and you think about what you've done, okay? Now let's get back to this show. Logan and I watched Season 3, Episode 4. It's entitled A Friend Indeed, and that had the original air date of November 18th, 1981. I think we're ready to jump on in. Let's face the facts with Logan Donahue. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Logan Donahue. Hi, in hi. In the house. In the flesh. In the living room, actually. <laughs> my, I call it my Your grand, grand room. You know that because you I listen know. to the show. I do. Logan, I am so happy that you are able to be here, and you had told me you were super crazy excited. I because was because you're a big fan of the Facts of Life. I am. I was one of the uh, ones that listened to it, listened to it. I listened to the Facts of Life. Yeah. No, I watched Facts of Life. It was in a podcast rerun. in 1981. <laughs> but yeah, I saw it in uh, in reruns once it it had uh, hit syndication back in. Goodness, maybe late 80s as a <sighs> child of the 80s. I'm 37, so um, that's how I think I watched. Um, Oh, what was the other one with Nell Carter? Where give was, me a, give me a break. Give me a break. Yeah, <laughs> that's my awful. My voice is terrible. Give me a break. Everything comes back to hair. By it the way, does. between Nell Carter and Charlotte Ray, you everything doing, comes back I to hair. I forgot today. that Charlotte Ray was in the movie Hair, mm -hmm. and during the show, you reminded me of that. It's little things that I'm obsessed with, and Nell Carter was one of the three yeah. black women that sang, and in all the different black women 
parts and hair. Um, it's, yeah. I, how do you do? You just did it too. How do you not do Nell Carter without just no. putting your voice up in your Ca- nose? Ain't got no home. Ain't got no shoes. Yeah. yeah. Ain't got no money. <laughs> that's it. That's yeah. <clears throat> I remember hearing something where they said all great vocalists have a distinct voice where oh, you yeah. hear them immediately and you're like, oh, I don't care what song they're singing. I know that's Judy Garland. I know that's yeah. Tori Amos. Or I know that's Rihanna or Rihanna. Sia. Yeah, like, exactly. Contem- absolutely. I'll be in the store and I'll be like, oh, I know who that is. That's a, that's the new Sia song, I guess. True. Yeah, so Nell Carter, I think, falls into that. <laughs> so it all comes back to, yes. But yeah, Give Me a um, Break was, well, yeah. back so in I, the day, the Saturday night after, right now where we are in the Facts of Life, it is on Wednesday night's at nine right after real people oh so that's why it is right now with the season we're in will be one of its best ratings wise because it was season. actually moved to a good because they had a good time slot good. and because they moved different strokes to another night because it mm. was performing strongly enough so that they move facts of life to the top of the hour okay. as opposed to being the second half so Where it's its own flagship show yeah and real people was hugely popular so people just kept the tv on and that's Aww. why facts of life continues to improve and grow but when the show later moves to saturday night it's part of a powerhouse lineup where it's give me a break facts of life golden girls 227 wow it's yeah <laughs> i would I, I wish I was watching back then. I was I was born eighty two, so I don't think I I saw that era of where, there TV. Were, where you had literally three yeah. or four choices. Yeah, there were all novelty things that kind of came into syndication once, like you know. I think I saw it on Fox actually, like late eighties, early 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 nineties, yeah. like. Well, yeah, maybe. and because in the late '80s, the Fox stations were the UHF stations. They were previously mm-hmm. the independent stations that were like, "Oh, we, we got have a, bought out." Yeah, there's this block of programming that we can connect into and build a viewership and be paid an affiliate. I think the affiliates were paid by the network to carry the signal yeah. back in the day. Uh, so you did grow up with the show. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is an important show to you. It is as a as a young, <laughs> blossoming gay boy. Yes. May, may I tell the audience that you are a homosexual? I am, in fact, a practicing homosexual, you... unrepentant. Uh... <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> I would say you're somewhat of a gay icon in our community. Oh, God. <laughs> with your fringe shows that you in do. In a weird way, I'm I'm of the new I'm of the new gay coven that's coming up. The coven. <laughs> As coven it, is as a it beautiful were. word. As it were. So there's the Jessica Lang era, and then I'm the newer upstarts uh, yeah, coming cause, in. Cause, um, uh, I'm not comparing Michael Wanzi to Jessica Lang. However, oh I'm comparing God. Michael Wanzi to Jessica Lang. Um, no. Just somehow, I want to be involved in this, and I want to be Sarah Paulson. Yes! Because everybody wants to be Sarah Paulson. She's so fucking amazing. You're- <laughs> so as I always like to start... The show, we've just watched season three, episode four, A Friend in Deed. Mm-hmm. That is two words, in deed, not the word indeed. And <laughs> uh, uh, I, clearly that was very important to somebody somewhere. Because, you know, they signed a contract and they want to make this have to do with mortgages. I, I, <laughs> why? Why in deed? They were paid by the words. word? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Probably, you know... I mean, Weird Hollywood rules, probably. Oh, it's it's true. But I mean, I kind of get, I get what they're talking about. Yeah. It, the episode does support friendship. The thing exactly about what you do is what makes you a friend. But let's let's not get too far ahead of ourselves because my show always has to start with my guest oh. giving a one to two sentence synopsis of the show we just watched, kind of like what you might see in a TV guide listing. Oh my gosh. <clears throat> On today's very ep- special episode of The Facts of Life, Blair Warner finds out what true friendship is and how to have something deeper than a superficial relationship with her mother. Logan. <laughs> I'm giving you the slow clap. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I only do that. It was a very special episode. Once, <laughs> but you did that with no those. spoilers. That's amazing. There were no spoilers. Yeah, no. I'm so proud of you. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. You've got to dance around what the subject of the, exactly. of the episode is and then not give it to them. So let's get started with the show yes. and the plot. Mm-hmm. Um, first things first, when the opening theme came along, 
Logan sang along with it. <laughs> as, as Nell Carter. <laughs> as Nell Carter. The lo- <laughs> Nell Carter. I'm going to release, this is off my upcoming album, Nell Carter Sings All the Theme Songs of the 1980s. Oh, like. Uh... <laughs> I don't know how offensive it is to have a 30-something uh Half Latino boy singing Nell Carter's voice, <laughs> but you know we're running with it. So, what would be the '80s theme songs that Nell Carter would sing? <laughs> um, obviously, the Snorks and Entertainment Tonight and uh, Entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> Entertainment Tonight. <laughs> we didn't know there was lyrics there, but Nell Carter's going to discover them for us. <laughs> Her name is Mary Hard, you're gonna love her. She's got legs and she shows a ma. <laughs> oh my god. Mary Hard and the Legs. There's an 80s reference for you. That would be a great band name. Mary Hard Ma- and the Legs. Mary Hart and the <laughs> Yes. Do it. Oh my god. Do it, and David. Then, and then the lead singer would be like my name isn't Mary Hart. <laughs> it's Darius like Hootie. Rucker's name is <laughs> like not Hootie. Hootie. It's like Hootie. My name is Logan Donahue. <laughs> I'm the lead singer for the band that's called Mary Hart and her legs. Oh, I want to be that indignant about something I do. <laughs> I really do. How dare you? <laughs> yeah. How dare you insult my art? Yeah, because everyone, it's like Darius Rucker. Who? Hootie. <laughs> Done. Know who it is. He should just embrace embrace it, Darius. He really should. <laughs> So our episode uh, yeah, the begins. Plot lines. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> our episode begins. Yes. Um with they are they're doing it's a cleaning day in it's the a cafeteria. Clean, day. clean and fold. All of the girls are cleaning. Mrs. Garrett is ironing. A gigantic is it a tablecloth? I believe it is a tablecloth because okay. it is round. Um they make a comment that Joe has been mopping the same spot. And what seems like a throwaway joke is actually setting up for a callback where Blair comes in with her catchphrase saying, Joe, I've just had one of my brilliant Brilliant ideas. ideas. If you move your feet while you're mopping, (laughs) you can get the whole floor clean and we can be done before noon. That's a cute little joke. It's all a thing. But the, the reason why we learn Joe is distracted is because she has an interview for a job at a bike shop mm-hmm. somewhere in Peekskill. And not bicycles. She likes motorbikes. Because Joe's a tough little cookie. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. Motorcycle <laughs> bike shop. Not a not a bicycle bike shop. Um, we have never talked about how Joe never did. We never ever heard response or follow up to Joe having to work at Harrison's department store on the weekends after the shoplifting episode. As sitcoms are wont to do, they threw that out and never brought it back. So I Joe, completely forgot about that. Joe was supposed to be working there, but we never heard of it. But let's assume she's fulfilled that commitment. <laughs> it was a temp gig. Yeah. It was and over the summer, You maybe. know that girl that stole something from us? Let's hire her. Let's make her work <laughs> for us. That's her punishment. We're going to give her the opportunity to continue to steal from us. I... <laughs> I would like to believe that the 80s were that world where that's how things worked, but oh. <laughs> the sitcom <laughs> the sitcom interpretation yeah. of the real life back then especially they, is like, they, uh, no. They digressed greatly, yes. Um, so that's what's going on with Joe. And then there's a phone call and Blair says, oddly, oh, I told mother to call me as soon as she got her facelift. Mm-hmm. That's a weird term. It's not like a facelift is a getting your nails done. I know. Well, I think that's why. Because they want to make it look like it's just no big deal to them. That I, she's I guess in a class so. That, oh, it's a Friday. You get yeah. your facelift. So, um... That's why um, Tootie has that j- throwaway joke about, um... Oh, imagine in the future... Is, does she oh, phrase that way? Like, yeah. going to McDonald's. Cosmetic surgery will be like going to McDonald's, and then she says the catchphrase. Yeah. I deserve a facelift today. <laughs> Which, in a way, Botox parties have become the advent of that oh, future yeah. that Tootie has envisioned. Yeah. Oh, if they could make drive through that type of... drive through Botox? drive through Botox, that's... I don't think we're far away from Just that. Just lean out your window and... Whoop, Yep, <laughs> exactly. And that joke landed hard. Tootie loved it. And for those who don't realize, you deserve a break today mm-hmm. was the McDonald's slogan of this time. Yes. That's what it's referring to. Socially relevant. 
Um, as leg warmers. Yes. So at one point, <laughs> Joe weighing in on um, mm-hmm. the facelift situation, she's like, ah, you are what you are. If you're old and you're ugly, you live with it. <laughs> Joe, always the pragmatist. She wants to really make sure you understand her blue collar upbringing yeah. and ethics. They they drive it home. They absolutely <laughs> do. They never fail to every episode. Well, then, um, who was on the phone, though? It turns out it was the... Um, the Moose Lodge on mm-hmm. the phone. And they were calling to say, hey, one of our bizarre, it was like a pet act or something, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, Has or something. canceled. And so, uh, Cousin Jerry. <laughs> Let's get the cerebral palsy girl instead. <laughs> yeah. And, well, Jerry, As Jerry was already. do. Like you do. Jerry was already working, but they're like, we need another 15 minutes out of her now. Mm -hmm. And so that's all fine and dandy. I'm going to point out that I believe in uh, the previous time that Jerry appeared, they Mm -hmm. called her Jerry Warner. And they called her Jerry Warner and because she's Blair's cousin. But from this point going forward, I believe she's credited as Jerry Tyler. Okay. And that does remain consistent with uh, how they're related because we learn in this episode Blair and Joe are cousins via their mothers being sisters. Yes. So when your mothers are sisters you ain't got the same last name. Now did did Jerry as a stand-up comedian have like a decent career outside of this? I'm deeply unfamiliar with her as a stand-up comedian outside of um, this for real Fairly, days. yeah. Okay. And there was also a public service commercial that showed some of her stand-up. Okay. This certainly gave her a much bigger, wider yeah. platform and all that. I mean, she was never, I mean, she wasn't Steve Martin no. or Bill Cosby or all that, but she enjoyed, I think, a fairly... Good on her. And, and still, I think, still does. I think she still does do stand-up, nice. just not as much. Oh, okay, I need to look up her stuff. I feel yeah. <laughs> negligent. There, so um, the, the message is for Jerry, and Mrs. Garrett's response is, um, oh, let her sleep, and we'll tell her when she comes down, I think is the term. Something, something that implied to me that she was upstairs oh. and she was asleep. We have discussed, where the fuck do people stay when they are staying as guests? I know. We're they... already in the cafeteria. I, the, a cafeteria that somehow has dormitories above it. Well, it was a storage room. The girls live in what was a storage room. And it looked like a garage. There was like oh, I know. a bike and shit up there. And nonetheless, uh, she is here and she has gotten the message. And in case we're not sure who she is, it's like, uh, wow, they need another 15 minutes. I need to come up with more jokes other than my cerebral palsy jokes. Yeah. So Jerry... Um, as a comedian, suddenly has to come up with fifteen more minutes of material. I can't. I can't come up with three. I... Um, stand-up comics. <laughs> if you are established in any way, shape, or form, yeah. A stand-up comic, you need. I think the term is like you know your tight ten kind yeah. of a thing. You need, and it can take you months or years to come up with your yeah. ten best minutes of material. Yep. And then as you continue to ascend the ranks and come up with more stuff, you over time have the 30 minute set in your brain versus Mm -hmm. the 15 minute versus the 10 minute. It's a very, it's a much more scientific process than people realize, I think. And I'm, and I'm not a stand up, but from what I've heard from a Kabillion podcast, anyway, (laughs) the idea that she has to come up with new jokes to create another 15 minutes. They make it feel like it. We're talking about a talent show rather than a, (laughs) yeah, it's very disturbing because it should be, (laughs) Hey, stand-up comic, can you do another 15? Stand-up comic would be like, fuck yes, it will cost you this much more. Yeah, exactly. But I've got it. If if she was this, this version point, of Jerry is local, local friend to everyone. I, I guess, yeah. Anyway, not too long <laughs> after Jerry appears, Mrs. Warner shows up. And it is not the Monica Warner we met in season one. And thank God, because Monica Warner in season one was horrible. I don't remember that. She looked like the love child of Olivia Newton-John oh. and Bo Derrick no. and Shelley Fabre. So I'm hearing hair here is Blonde the thing. Okay. hair. And to really emphasize the link to Blair. And the, well, the emphasis of the episode was that she was too much of a flirt. And we think she kissed one of the other dads who was married. <gasps> and so Blair went through this crisis of, I don't want to be no. like my mother. 
Oh my god. So we have completely retconned this no, relationship we have. and for the better cuz this is fan fucking tastic. No, like I was actually really impressed at this having like meat and potatoes for a for this... a light summary TV show. Yeah. Well, we're we're in the latter part now. This is this is more Thanksgiving. This is the heavier turkey and <laughs> turkey and taters kind of show yeah. cuz we're in we're in later in the year now of 81. So, um, but who cares? You know, it's one of those things like retconning, not cool, but when they do it because they're correcting something that was awful or a fuck up, yeah, bring it. I'm good. If you do it right, we'll, we'll forgive it. This is more significant than just mommy kisses people. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and it's the wonderful actress Marge Doucet is her name. Okay. And she is a soap opera actress and it shows. Oh, girl. And she is fucking Awesome. She knows how to walk to the bottom of the frame, sit and cry on yeah. command. Do, 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 yeah. do. <sighs> she knows her way around a soundstage. She knew her camera angles. Yeah. This bitch had it going She's on. Really good. I fucking love her. And I love that <laughs> she is from now going forward. She is Blair's mother. This will always be the actress who plays that is her. Fantastic. And and it's wonderful. The I'm consistency so- is great. Um, so what we've got going on is She's there. Oh, what are you doing here? We didn't expect this visit. Oh, I postponed the surgery. I didn't have the facelift after all. And she glibly tosses it off like, oh, I got to the hospital and everything was green and I just couldn't deal with it. The food was green. The hallways were green. Yes. And <laughs> so it's like, oh, okay, fine, whatever. And it's a sitcom, so we just laugh it off. Ha <laughs> ha, okay. Yeah. Now we do have to, uh, before we continue with the plot... We because there's talk of earlier of the of the cosmetic surgery, mm-hmm. and she says to Mrs. Garrett, "Oh, I bet you think this is all ridiculous, don't you?" And so Miss, we have to get Mrs. Garrett, the star of the show, has to weigh in, and she says, "Oh, I don't mind. You are going to do your Mrs. Garrett impression Ow. before we're done. Um, <laughs> if it makes you feel better, I'm all for it." So it's like, okay. And if you have a spare forty thousand dollars laying around. Um, but that we do get Mrs. Garrett's weighing in on it. Yes. So then the moment happens where uh Monica, Mrs. Yes. Warner, Blair's Mrs. mom, Warner. says, oh, I've just had one of my brilliant ideas. But um bump reincorporation. Callback mm-hmm. and cut to reaction shot of Joe who's still mopping. Next to Mrs. Garrett, Joe's eyes are like... This is did, where it comes from. Did I just hear another human being say this shit that drives me crazy? Mm-hmm. The, the reaction it's helped good. elevate it further, but it was it crushed as a callback where you're like, Blair's mother says that. Mm-hmm. She's also a privileged white woman. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> so um, her brilliant idea is that uh, why doesn't Blair not take care of her responsibilities why doesn't she come shopping with me and we can have some other daughter time her. yeah so mrs garrett says i can do without her fuck blair get her out of here <laughs> um so blair goes to get ready now in the meantime joe expressing nervousness about this interview yes for this motorcycle shop She's not sure what to wear. One of the other girls says, why don't you ask Blair? And she's like, I'm not asking Blair. She's just going to be a bitch to me. Mm -hmm. And blah, blah, blah. Well, Joe decides to do it. So Joe kind of a little bit's like, you know, I don't know what to wear. So I was kind of, you know, and Blair's like, what? What are you, what are you asking? Are you trying? Do you need to say the word help? Yeah. Like leads are there. Yeah. She's like, are you you going to force me to have to say it out loud? Uh-huh. And so, oh, oh, earlier Blair does dig at Joe saying, no bike shop is going to hire you because you have no people skills is what she basically says. You're coarse yeah. and you're grading and you're blunt. Those aren't the right words, but she does kind of cut Joe down a little bit with that. Well, She says, fine, Joe, I will help you. And puts her arm around her. The frenemy relationship Mm -hmm. is still, I think, a beautiful thing to behold. So at this point, Monica is left alone with Jerry. And cousin Jerry walks up and says, (laughs) so Blair doesn't know, does she? And Monica's like, what? And she says, my mother told me 
what the doctor said. And Monica makes some type of a mark. Oh, that sister of mine, she just can't keep yeah. her mouth shut. So it's like, aha. So we know that Monica Exposition. and sister. Exactly. Monica and sister <laughs> are the parents of Blair and Jerry. And Jerry ever in service to Blair's plots. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then um, and then Monica says, I really can't talk about it. Please hush if you would. Just please don't tell her. I, I can't deal with it. All, so, and, it, and it, she does say what the doctor said. So we know mm-hmm. it's a medical thing. Mm-hmm. So Monica and just says. serious. Yeah. So Monica leaves and we leave Jerry alone for one of those long, uncomfortable reaction shots where it's like, oh, please, <laughs> someone call look. cut. Yeah. So Jerry is left alone looking off, exceptionally worried. And it's like, ooh, mm-hmm. Jerry, she's doing fine. But she's not an actress. Yeah. We need to have the music swell and cut to commercial. Yeah. And <laughs> the music would have helped. But um, but the thing is, we're not to commercial yet. We're going to the next scene. So it's like a slow lingering shot and then the slow dissolve. So then the next scene, we're in the parlor and there are all kinds of bags and boxes and colorful tissue paper. Mm. And oh, and they say, Blair, you must have bought out all of Harrison's. And Harrison's, that's the department store where Joe stole the shirt from. I have a feeling it's the only department store that exists in their universe. In Peekskill, yeah. It's <laughs> the department store. The. Yeah. Um, so then the phone rings. Tootie answers the phone, and yes. she says, oh, it's for you, Blair. It's a Dr. Wyman. And Blair answers the phone, and she says, hi, Dr. Sid. Mm-hmm. And then she's all friendly with him, and she's like, well, you know... I forget how she words it, but yeah. she says family something. doctor. Well, she she implies the family doctor, but she says, "Oh well, uh, how could I not be happy to hear from the man who brought me into the world?" Kind of a, it's like, okay, is he the family doctor or is he an OBGYN? I think they're trying to establish it as the general family doctor that also kind of theoretically does everything, because they say that later on when um. The mother and Blair have the whole like meltdown in the mother's ugly ass hotel room. Mm-hmm. She has we will, the, we will discuss. She has the throwaway line of like he couldn't resist calling me when when if I was finding out you were pregnant. Oh, uh, that's that right. I was pregnant yeah, with yeah. you. Yeah, that's so. right. Yeah. So yeah, they they're they're working to they they have to create this sense of he's a family friend. Yeah. Maybe it might. But I guess, you know, he, he feels close enough to Blair yeah. that when uh, Blair says, oh, yeah, well, mother ended up here. You know, she told me about the ordeal at the hospital. And then, you know, Dr. Sid, family friend, let's violate HIPAA and give medical information. <laughs> this about- is all pre-HIPAA. And all pre-HIPAA. Is, is HIPAA? How- HIPAA is Clinton era. Believe it, it or not. really? Uh-huh. Oh. And I'm going to get like old school. So like one of my things, before I was a local theater impresario. <laughs> no, I, I was, you know, fledgling teenage activist. I was okay. like, you know, I did a lot of stuff with Hope and Help Center and other ones. And um, they had this whole thing basically talking about how HIPAA had been instituted. And one of the things with how HIPAA came about was because people were being very loose and carefree with people's HIV statuses and things you could call over the phone about or not back and forth. And even one of the big pieces, um, Anthony Perkins. Okay. um, Yeah. From Psycho. Psycho. uh, He got his HIV test results through the National Enquirer. Mm. They had intercepted his test results. Either there was a leak somewhere in the office or something. And it was announced in the National Enquirer. And it turned into this huge case of like, what can and cannot a doctor's office disclose? I did not know. And it all aired on the side of, nah, no, it has to be the person in person with a password of their birth date. Yeah, with yeah. All these things basically saying like, look, you can't do this anymore. You can't just say like, oh, I'll send that over to my husband, you know, yeah. which was the common parlance. So yeah, this 80s was pretty, pretty back backwards back then where you it was see, like oh yeah just let everyone talk about it we don't know i knew that i knew that hippo was not didn't always exist i was thinking it was like a 50s or a 60s thing it's it's yeah, 90s, it's 90s. Mm-hmm. wow clinton era did not know that yeah the more you know whoosh, whoosh. 
star. <laughs> so, um, all right. So this doctor was perfectly within his right. Yeah. And he was assuming. <laughs> and he was assuming. He was and assuming He was a making lot. an assumption. And if he's a family friend, and Blair did say the that ordeal was, at the yeah. hospital. Mm-hmm. And so Blair hangs up and has a pretty dramatic scene where to the point Mrs. Garrett, almost, she, her mantra, he thought I knew. Mm-hmm. He thought I knew. And she, oh, Mrs. Garrett almost has to hold her up. And she says she was at the hospital. She wasn't not getting a facelift. She was having a biopsy. She has a tumor in her breast. Yeah. And then it cuts. And then it fades to black. No clap track. It's silent. It's Just to let dramistic. you know the gravitas. Yeah. The I gravitas. Beautiful. I love that word. <laughs> so it is commercial time. That means that we need to talk to Logan Donahue and... <laughs> Getting to know you. Yes. Um, I'd like to do a little James lipton kind of a thing as far as uh, <laughs> we are. We've never worked together. We're only just friends through the theatre community. Yeah, I think. Yeah, no, I don't think we've, we've ever actually we never done have, a project before. Though I've enjoyed many of your shows, your one-man shows that you've done at the Thank Orlando you. Fringe Festivals. Yes. But um, let's start with Logan Donahue. Where were you born? Uh, born Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Oh, I'm a lifelong local, technically. Wow. And yeah, I moved here as a baby. So yeah, I moved here and when I was one. And you've been in one. Orlando? Orlando. Since yeah. you were a baby. Mm-hmm. Wow. Grew up on Lee Road and then moved to Castleberry for middle school. And yeah, went wow. to St. Margaret Mary Catholic School for nine years on Park Avenue. Wow. So I grew up with Blairs. I grew I up with an <laughs> ocean of Blairs. You went to the, the Eastland of Central Florida. Yes. I was a delicate <laughs> blend of Natalie and Joe <laughs> <laughs> growing up <laughs> with an wow. ocean of Blairs. Um, so, yeah. so uh, and then where did you go to school? What was your educa- your higher education? I went to Winter Park High School. And then after Winter Park High School, I decided to take some time off and not go to college and enter into the workforce as I was a fledgling activist. Okay. And yeah, I, so I worked for the center and I worked for Hope and Help and um, then just random odd jobs of office work and mm-hmm. PR stuff and marketing. And I just kind of made my way through there. I actually never matriculated at secondary education wow. myself. I know. I've actually... I've gone back and forth on it, but as, you know, as a theater person, really going to college is to build up a resume, and and I've built up a resume the other way, and yeah, I'm okay with that. We've talked about that, because I, I have a college degree, but it's not in theater. That's yeah. not what I studied. I studied cinema, actually. Oh, that's awesome. So, gee, and I talk about movies and TV all the time. <laughs> Give me a degree in that. Um <laughs> So we talked about that. Megan Maroney is the same way. Megan Maroney did not finish her... College, college because she was too busy working and she's yeah. like well this is crazy why am i paying someone to teach yep. me to act when other people are paying me while i'm learning yeah. to act? and i mean every once in a while i'll be like oh man if i had my ba i could get you know this job or this job where the requirement is at least a ba but i'm like mm-hmm. eh, if it becomes too much of a thing i'll go for that someday but yeah pff, right now but right now into 40s i'm good i'm, I'm happy mm-hmm. so bleh. <laughs> and that's it and as I've said many times before, Central Florida is great where you can keep a day job if that's what you need to sustain you and do theater at night on the weekends. There are so many outlets to perform here. And then the Fringe Festival is kind of where I think you've found a great deal of your footing and made a name for yourself in the community. Yeah. A lot of people know me through that. And I've started touring with it. I went to Edmonton last year, and I'm mm-hmm. going back this year. Yeah. I did the Tampa Fringe Festival last year as well. Um, did you work with SAC? Remind me. Are you a SAC um, I went to, quote unquote, school yeah. at SAC. So I went through the four levels of improv that they did and okay. graduated through there. Um, That's technically a higher education. It's just not a degree. I mean, it's, it's not just a degree. focus. It's it's basically trade school is what it is. That's a good way to think of it's it. It's a year and a half of trade school. It's a trade school. And <laughs> damn, it serves you well in this in this it, market. It yeah. does. And anytime I see people that struggle with improv, I'm like, God, take an improv class. Yeah. Talk about your fringe shows specifically. Yeah. I I have to admit, I did not see a field guide show until this year. Oh, goodness. I you missed saw it my... once. I saw Slut Like Me. Okay. And I saw this. And that am works. I correct? Slut Like Me was... Field guide to being a slut. Yes, mm-hmm. it yeah. was like that. Um, so your shows, one. your shows, all have this. They're called the field guide too. Yeah, or a lot of them have. Um, I've I've 
bounce back and forth of wanting to use the field guide phrase in this one. I'm like, okay, I'm going back to it for this one. But um, yeah, I usually refer to them as like infotainment. Yeah. They're kind of stand up with slides. I like doing a TED Talk format for my solo shows. Yeah. That's a great way to describe it. That's yeah, exactly, exactly. what it is. Um, so the first one you did was the field guide to the gays. Well, it started, ooh, actually, it started with a show called Trash Cinema 101. Trash? And Trash Cinema 101. Cinema, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so I elucidate me. I wanted to go into uh, being a Rocky Horror host, and that being what most people knew me as. Mm -hmm. Um, I just was in love with all those old school horror hosts: Elvira, Vampira, um, Zachary, all that era of 1950s, 1960s horror hosts. So I was in love with that archetype, and I was like, "Well, I love Rocky Horror, but I also love all these other old school weird B movies. So why don't I do Mm -hmm. a show talking about my love for B movies and talking about what I think is awesome about B movies?" And so I did um, seven films in 60 minutes, zero class, and and I basically went through these different archetypical films like i did um nightmare on elm street 2 uh can't stop the music oh. faster pussycat kill kill phantom of the paradise so yeah i did and, a whole show trash cinema was and, my and thing. that was your first that was my first solo show um, at the fringe in at orlando. the fringe in orlando and, and then, then how many total have you done oh my god at least five right I've done, yeah, let me think. I did Trash Cinema. Then I did Field Guide to the Gays, which was my big one that took off. Um, then and that I did was a, literally you saying, okay, world at large, I'm going to teach you what you need to know about gay people. Yeah. Because clearly straight people, you don't fucking get it. <laughs> I basically took all the uncomfortable conversations I've ever had with a well-meaning straight person. Okay. Or sometimes not well-meaning. Um, yeah. And so I was like, what if I just took all of those answers and made people pay? Literally. Yeah. Just sit down. Oh, I'll, I'll tell you. Yeah, but, and I'll make it funny. And yeah, I'll, but yeah, let's put it into a show. And I liked, I really liked doing it. It was both very therapeutic, and people honestly want to know these things. They're like, I, I'm too afraid to ask. Yeah, I really want to know why you guys use this slang. Why is a pride parade a big deal? Why don't straight people have a straight pride parade? Oh, yeah. I was like, oh, man, yes. I, I have an answer for that. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm like, boop boop boop. Um, so yeah, I basically made that show. I did a sequel to it. I did a mini autobiographical show that played once when I was off campus at the venue at Fringe once. What was that called? Um, (laughs) That was another field guide one. I was field guide to Logan. Oh, okay. Um, (laughs) But that was me having therapy live on stage in front of God and everybody. As many Fringe shows turn out to be. It was self-indulgent yum yum time. But I actually found some good um, stand-up material out of it. So I think I'll reincorporate that someday. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I did... um, Goodness. Then I did Slut Like Me, mm-hmm. which was my other big one. Um, and then I did Unbelievable, which was ha- la- two years ago, right after the election. And uh-huh. I basically made a show on how I felt we could survive, if not thrive, over the next four years, if you are anywhere on the left of the spectrum to yeah. the current administration. Um, and about how all those of us on the left of that spectrum can maybe get along with each other and have more patience with each other as we're angry. Mm. Yes. <laughs> and, yes. not- and not burn out and be yeah, most not- effective. Fight with each other. Exactly. When, yeah. Which, I mean, you know, families fight, but. Yeah. Um, and then finally, um, this year, I kind of took two years off to go and tour Field Guide to the Gays to Tampa and Edmonton. And then this year, I came back and actually did uh, this one, Field Guide to, I don't know if I can curse you, on your show. Yes, you may. Field Guide to Not Being an Asshole <gasps> was my newest show. Not the A word. Yeah. And it was, not... it was more serious. It was more serious than Field Guide to the Gays or Slut Like Me. Um. I wanted it to be more light, but the finished product that made it to this version of Fringe, I was like, I have a lot of serious things to say, and fuck it. Like, I want to say them. I'm going to say them. Here we go. Uh, Do you have any other Fringe shows or stand-up type of things in the works now for the future? Yeah, I have um, random one-off burlesque acts um, for different... um, different, groups around town, mostly with the Big Bang Boom Cabaret over at the venue. Okay, sure. Um, then I have uh, the Comedy Brunch over at Parliament House coming up in July. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'm taking my show over, Field Guide to the Gays, back to Edmonton. 
uh, this coming August. And I'm also putting a lot of my stuff online now. So I've kind of switched over to YouTube. And if people want to sponsor me on Patreon, oh. um, kind of as a year round, like, hey, look, lo- there's lulls between Sup- gigs. Support an artist. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And seriously, most people are like, oh, a dollar a month will help you here. So I'm more than happy to receive that help. Well, so. I will post links to your YouTube channel Thank as you. well as your Patreon. I, I don't have it. a Patreon yet. I'm. Yeah. I'm in the larval stages of thinking about it, yeah. but I still don't feel quite ready to start asking people totally for money. I totally understand. So that's great. You've got a lot of projects coming up. Yeah. And that's that's the beauty of our community here is that you can mm-hmm. have your fingers in different pies, as they yes, say. You can have so. a lot of different little things going on, and that's great. So yeah. I always enjoy your shows and you, you. and this is like the, literally the first time we've ever hung out. Yeah, like we, I think we hung out like on the Friendsgiving Thanksgiving thing, but it's always been, you know, just in general or like running yeah, into each other. like we it's, run into each other. And or then groups we'll, of people. An hour later, we're still in the kitchen babbling about the same stuff. Yeah, you, you turned me on to Hannah. Um, oh, God. What's Hannah Gadsby. One? Hannah Gadsby's show. Oh, yeah. what a great special. So beautiful and heavy. Yes. So okay. yeah, I'm glad that we got to hang out today. Yeah. Yeah. So let's get back to uh huh. Uh, back from commercial, and what we've got is we're in the kitchen mm-hmm. once again. No food. <laughs> None. Nope. Ain't ain't a damn piece of food anywhere <laughs> for these girls who are preparing allegedly three meals a day for the for school. An unnamed school. For with an unnamed student not, body. Uh, yeah. Exactly. To the best of we can figure, we know there are over twenty girls there due to the um, due to the self defense class. Oh, that was the, I think the most number of extras we've seen ever. Um, oh, oh, and what Blair's doing—we're not working with food. Blair is folding either tablecloths or cloth napkins. I, thought, I think they're napkins. They're big napkins. They're large. Huge. Yeah, they're but like full lap. <laughs> full lap and tuck into your shirt or something. <laughs> um, but the thing is, Blair is supposed to be going to dinner with her mother and. <laughs> Typical sitcom, Mrs. Garrett, aren't you supposed to be going, no, I'm not going to dinner. I can't face her. Okay, well, guess you're never going to talk to your mother again. Bye. (laughs) (sighs) But Mrs. Garrett's trying to be encouraging. It may not be as bad, but Blair's thing is uh, mother is so concerned about the way she looks. Mm. And we know that if she's sick, if she has some health issues coming up, that's going to affect that. And then Tootie comes down. Yeah. And Tootie, uh, you already know, heard her talk about. She was in the room. Yeah. And so the room Blair says happened. she's really sorry. And Blair kind of says something kind of accusatory about, yeah, what's well, going to be all over the whole campus by the morning. And Tootie says, what does she say? I'm not that kind of a jerk. What yeah, she- I'm not. Yeah, I'm not that kind of a jerk. But she says, this isn't gossip. I wouldn't say anything. And then the the moment turns really kind of serious. She's like, I swear on our friendship. And finally, Blair softens and they hug. It was kind of a little heavy, good, deep friendship moment. Yeah. I'm not sure this was called for, but okay, fine. Yeah. Uh, and then the moment is broken by Joe bursting into the kitchen hysterical. Natalie is following her, trying to stop her, and Joe is running through the drawers. She says, I need a pair of scissors. I'm looking for a fuse. I need matches. I got that. And Mrs. Garrett's like, what are you doing? You kind of sound like you're building a bomb. She and, is. And Natalie's like, she is. So, suffice it to say, Joe, <laughs> you didn't get the job at the motorcycle play. She's like, just give me one thing. I'll take it, do it. And bam, boom, dead Kawasaki's everywhere. Having N- full Unabomber mode before yeah, Unabomber. To a big laugh. And a big laugh. Aww. Big laugh. Oh, she's going to be a terrorist. <laughs> 80s terrorism was so much lighter. Uh-huh. Remember when... <laughs> <laughs> Those weird Iranians and chasing Doc Brown. Yes. So then when Joe finally calms down, yes, Blair and she have this moment where Blair says to her, look, you didn't get that job. Like you said earlier, you are who you are. And if they don't like it, that's their problem. Yeah. And she said, she, what was her car term? They can blow it out their gear Crankshaft or crankshaft gear yeah, their box. Can, or something like that. <laughs> yeah. So um, there's this good moment where Blair interestingly comforts this this is the friend of me relationship i love so much where she says 
no. If they don't like you and they don't want you to work, that's their fucking problem. Yeah. And it does make Joe feel better. In so many words. In so many. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> um, and then after she's gone, Mrs. Garrett says, that was really lovely what you just did. And she's like, and Blair honestly is dismissive. She's like, what? I didn't do anything. Yeah. And Mrs. Garrett says, you were there for her. You yeah. helped her. You were just a very good friend. Yep. So why can't you do the same for your mother? <laughs> anyway. You so, love your Charlotte Ray impersonation I, so much. I, I can't say her Girl. words unlike her. And then Mrs. Garrett in oh, Mrs. Garrett's superpower talking about the first time she saw her father cry and how it frightened her. But it was a turning point. It's when she realized. For both of us. For both of us, that's right. <laughs> she realized she wasn't a kid anymore. Like yeah. realizing that your your parents becoming human. That's that's yep. a beautiful, appropriate, good story that she tells. And clearly she convinces Blair because our next scene, the final scene of the episode, is in... We, we originally were like, where are we? Because you said, is, she, is Monica staying at Eastland? Is this a room at the school? <coughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, no. So yeah, there was this moment where. <laughs> well, they... here's the thing. You were right to ask that because that room is fugly as <laughs> sin. There's like a wooden fish on the wall. There and is... there's a bicentennial flag. It's all dark, and in the background is this big eucalyptus plant. And eucalyptus is just <laughs> not a very. It's not a vibrant color. They no. were. I mean, we. I, I remember... think they painted them. Um, like I think they were dipped in paint. Like. Uh, oof, whatever it is, that they're, era of they're, they're just not the most briving, bright, <laughs> thriving, cheerful um, plant. It's just, it's, it is an ugly yeah. ass hotel room. The and only thing that lets us know it's a hotel is because they have that little like informational plaque that's on the top of the TV. Yes, checkout time and stuff. That yeah. was there. Um, so part of me is just like, for how rich the, War the Warner family is, <laughs> is this the nicest hotel they can find? They don't have a... Well, do they ever explore the idea of that that school is in like a remote piece of New England? No, it's in Peekskill, New York. We're an hour outside of the city. Uh, still a... An hour outside of the city is still kind of like rustic, where it's not I mean, like yeah. It's it it starts feeling like Maine, <laughs> like I mean, that sort I, of like oh, I hear you. Trees. But, so I think they wanted to establish like oh this is just like a small bed and breakfast, small hotel, uh, maybe small town. But if we have Eastland Academy and Bates Academy, mm. and they have the longevity that they claim to have, they have to have at least one nice luxury hotel. Who somewhere would in not town. be smart enough to say, I'm a hotel mogul. I'm going to build a nice luxury hotel yeah. there for when the family stay. <laughs> uh, just throwing that out. There. So and the set dressers <laughs> really dropped the ball there said, Oh, just a hotel room. Yeah. Well, we'll make it look as lovely as the girls dorms in season one. It's a converted TGI Fridays. <laughs> that we, <laughs> that we turned into a hotel room. Yeah. It is, it is not pretty. It's very There's depressing. There's no shoes and, on the wall, and we don't know why. Oh, and the closet is open air. There's not even a door mm -hmm. for the closet. And, and clock the wood bicentennial flag. Yeah, there's a, there's a really? bicentennial wooden rustic. Yeah, this is a, a terribly rustic place where I don't get the... <laughs> Peekskill is not that far out of the city. No. <laughs> but the deal is, um, she is there. Uh, Blair shows up. And out of the blue, she's like, oh, hello, that's great. And Monica says, let's go to Hawaii. What do you think? Let's just take off on a mm -hmm. trip. And Blair starts packing her mother's suitcase. And she's like, what's going on? And she says... Packing poorly, might I add. Very poorly. <laughs> Dramatically, yes. Efficiently, no. The mother gives us the most delicious line, you're crinkling my crepe. I know. <laughs> I wrote that down. Oh, bless. Oh, bless. So Blair says, no, you need to go back to the doctor and find the results of the biopsy. And Marge, to say this, she just crushes all the dramatic moments of the scene. And she says, I already got the damn results of the biopsy. She's so good. She's and, so good. And then she stops and thankfully she says, who told you? And she re suddenly realizes, wait a minute, you're not supposed to know yeah. about that. And then Blair Blair's says, Dr. Called. Sid called. Or no, her response is, not the person who should have. Oh, that's right. And then, I'm like, ooh! 
<laughs> yeah, no, Come she's on, right. Lady. Yep, throw down with mom. <laughs> and then Monica says, well, Dr. Sid called, yeah. and he said he needed to see me. That means it's pretty bad news. They never give you the bad news on the phone. They always give you good news. Remember, he couldn't wait to tell me when I was pregnant with you. Yep, which establishes all the family doctor stuff. Such good... That's good. This is a well-written this episode is, to put is. exposition about their life all the way down into like the last scene. I'm like, yeah. girl. <laughs> Blair says smartly. She needs to say, well, you need to see what it's going to be. Maybe it'll be all right. And Monica's like, it's never going to be all right again. Wow. And at the very least, Blair has to boil it down to, well, what now? What, what are you going to do now? And she says, you can't run away from this. How am I going to help you? And um, and she comes back. And what's going on here? Because we earlier said it's a tumor in her breast. I think that the, the thing we have to remember here is in 1981, breast cancer yeah. automatically meant mastectomy. They just Auto- yeah. cut that shit off. And that's, they try to do a little education with the show. With Because um, Blair has the voice of the new generation. Yeah. It's like, it's not that automatic anymore. And like, they're trying yeah. to do an advocacy thing. There are letting all the different audience... types of treatments available to cancer patients now, mom. And... <laughs> Let me speak about it. Yeah. And so, but it, truthfully, that's what I actually, I went down the Wikipedia hole when you were watching me like, go, oh yeah. God, um, I wanted to look up what the treatments were like in 81. Like, I didn't know for real. And they basically were talking about how it was radiology mm-hmm. and surgery, and that was about it. And they were starting the early stages of, hey, there's chemotherapy. Maybe this yeah. will work. Lumpectomies can sometimes be a first line of defense and yeah. then see if we need to go to the next level. Yeah, yeah. so chemotherapy was still kind of new, and the rate of it spreading and it being a life-threatening, you probably will die, was still really high at that time. Was it really? Yeah. It wow. wasn't like a... like. We know for sure, but it was like the the rate did not plummet until the 90s. Wow. Where like, you know, then it finally got codified, pink ribbons, all that stuff. Breast cancer was still kind of a like... <gasps> there was stigma. Yeah, stigma and dire... Yeah, and and not it's we're not discussing it because it's talking about a woman's body. Yes, and and the idea that if you lose a breast, you're losing your womanhood. Yeah, and no, it's yeah, not no, that. it was the the stigma was huge. So mm-hmm. her reaction is really it, it seems a little melodramatic no. by today's standards. I do not think that this is that over the top for no. what at the time that they were doing. This yeah. is kind of spot on and using a soap actress was such a good tactical yes! move oh. monica also does bring into the mix mm-hmm. a very common thing i wanted to spare you i didn't want you to worry about me mm. that's such a parental thing such that's a parental so thing good. and um blair maybe i think blair says you can't hide from this you can't just go swimming in a swimming pool in hawaii and she says no i can't because the chlorine turns my hair orange yeah (laughs) and it's like um marge you have dark brown almost brown black hair even color treated brown black hair will not turn orange in chlorine i think they're like fantasizing over the idea of like you know oh it'll the bleach in the pool yeah the chlorine will strip the hair like yeah girl if you have super bleachy blonde hair yeah the chlorine the chlorine will turn it green green actually yeah Yeah. and green Um, is not her color as we discovered earlier (laughs) nice call back (laughs) theater nice (laughs) So we come to, Blair says, we Warner women are a lot stronger than people think we are. Such a good line. And Monica says, oh, whenever i faced with uh, with a crisis, I always think, what would Betty Davis do? <laughs> That's where she goes into the smoking And then joke. she says she would light up a cigarette and, well, I quit smoking. So we do allude to the fact that she was a smoker and that could be yeah. what caused her breast cancer. Maybe. FYI. Um, but then she does admit she's scared. Blair says, let's use the buddy system. I can be a good friend. Um, I think that's where the pool comes in. Buddy you can swimming. use the buddy system because like when you swim in the pool. I can hold I, you up. I got ahead of myself. But Blair takes it to another level here. We could have just ended the episode saying, we'll get through this together, hold hands, end of episode. But um, she says, I can be a good friend. And Blair goes further to say, you realize we're not friends. We're just playmates. Yeah. We gossip. We talk about clothes and men. We have a deeply superficial relationship. I love that phrasing. And it calls back actually to when the girls see the two of them 
gossiping at the beginning of the episode, yeah. they refer to them as like, oh my God, they're like girlfriends. Yeah, they Like do. laughing at how inappropriately non-mother-daughter their relationship is. Yeah. How it's just, eh, it's Along with the, with, the, with the brilliant ideas callback, friends. too. So, and it ends up with her saying, well, what do you need from me? And she says, well, uh, what can I do for you? And she says, just keep doing what you're doing. Um, yeah, more of this. And then it ends with, um, you really are a beautiful girl. And yeah. she says, well, mother, I look just like you. And she says, I wasn't talking about your face. Yeah. Uh, I was <laughs> now in the fields. It's so good. And my fields were felting. <laughs> and it was beautiful. You were in field land? I was. So has Blair ever been this self-aware? Like, I don't think I've ever seen Blair off the top of my head, and they might revisit it in other special episodes. But I don't remember Blair ever being self-aware of like, hey, I'm glib and flippant and superficial. Like she I, yeah. never, <laughs> I don't think I've, I remember that character having many come to Jesus moments with herself about her behaviors or her. <laughs> she, the, the way I've always described Blair is Blair is vain, yeah. surface, superficial. And that's her default. Mm -hmm. But when the chips are down, yeah. she is a great friend. She does have a sense of what is really going on. Yeah. And she always comes through. And that I I fear the day is coming. I'm going to be watching an episode and they're going to fuck it up because I don't oh, remember Blair, all these. I but have a right feeling now, Blair's going to be an antagonist somewhere. Uh, but right now. She's going to have to be like, the one that learns. It is. Yeah. But this is this is a great Blair. And we haven't had that many Blair centric episodes since Joe came along, where oh. it's like we've been giving a lot to Nancy McKeon and and to Tootie and to Tootie. Natalie and stuff. Mm -hmm. This is kind of I can't remember a, a, a this Blair centric episode. Yeah, and I I was left, I noted earlier I was like Jerry seems to always be in service of Blair plot lines. So you were yeah. saying how this is the second Jerry episode. Yeah. And her worried look at the end of that scene. She's gone. We never yeah. hear from her the rest of the episode. <laughs> we're good. She's off performing at the Elks Lodge in, per in yeah. perpetuity. She has a residency <laughs> at the, the Elks. The, Monica to say to her, well, you're at the Moose Lodge and then you're over at the Elks and then the Lions Club. Guess it's a jungle out there. <laughs> it's a very lovely little... <laughs> Thing. But this is a great episode. It really was. I really like it. It really is. It resonates. It's so, it shakes the etch-a-sketch upside down mm -hmm. of the mother-daughter relationship that we suffered through in that awful episode in season one. It's so, I Ugh. I need to go back and see that episode. It's awful. You gotta see oh it. Oh my God. I could have sworn <laughs> I remember hearing about that, but. Mm -mm. Yeah. Yeah. But um, Logan, I'm so glad you were Thank so you for enthusiastic. Me. You wanted to do this I so really badly. Do. I love 80s stuff. I love things I remember from my childhood. And this is such a fond, weird little gay boy thing for me that I'm like, I want to do an episode. <laughs> and so when you mentioned like, oh, I'll have you on. I'm like, really? Okay. <laughs> so I'm really happy to be here. So seriously, thank you. Oh, you're, you are very welcome. Thank you. And I hope this isn't the last time. Hope to have you back. Thank you. I look forward to it. Bye. Bye. And there you have it. That was Logan Donahue. I really have nothing more to add to this episode. I made all the points I want to make. I didn't have any extra notations of stuff I wanted to talk about other than let's let's just relish in what a wonderful addition Marge Doucet is to the series now in the role of Monica Warner. And let's all just be so happy that we've got her and that she's here to stay because she will be here for the long haul. We've got her appearing in seven more episodes after this over the next few years. That is very good news. Next week, I'm going to be watching Season 3, Episode 5. It is called Front Page. And my special guest is going to be actor Joe Lorenz. That's all for this week. Thanks so much for listening to this show. And remember, the facts of life are all about you. Let's Face the Facts was produced, written, hosted, and edited by David Almeida. That's me. My theme song was beautifully arranged and recorded by Ned Wilkinson. Our website is facethefactspod.com. You have to drop the let's. 
and that's where you can find extra pictures, videos, and audio extras from the digital cutting room floor. Follow the show on social media under the handle Face the Facts Pod, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the show. Tune in again next week and every week for another thrilling episode of Let's Face the Facts. <laughs>